welcome to Stripping the Dipping. You're joined by your usual co-host, AMG Dent, Denzel Clarkson, aka the British Michael B. Jordan. And you're here for the fourth episode of the Summer Series Shutdown. And what can I tell you guys? We've got a really amazing guest. She's originally from Greensboro, North Carolina, although she's actually in the Motor City right now. And she's such an inspiring and prominent star and an exciting multimedia reporter and journalist for the likes of Fox Sports. And also she's worked with ESPN as well. So I hope that you all share the same excitement as me, as we have the amazing Amanda Busick on the podcast today. Amanda, how are things going? Oh, goodness. Thank you for uh, having me on, guys. And uh, as you said, currently in the Motor City, but uh, that is, uh, uh, you, you guys calling it your summer series. I guess I'm on my summer tour as well with motorsport. Of course. And I'm really happy as well that our stars are aligned in this way. Yeah, no, it's great. It's, uh, I have a, you, you guys know how the lifestyle is. You have one day off and then you're back on the road. So uh, this is absolute perfect timing. <laughs> of course, of course, Amanda, it does get quite treacherous. Well, I definitely am really excited about bringing you on, Amanda, because there's so much to unpack and so much I feel that, you know, we could learn about you, what you do, and so many things for our listeners to kind of take away from this conversation as well. So the first thing I wanted to get into, Amanda, is how did your career begin in reporting and journalism? And, you know, what was the uh, the background like for you culturally with your family? Were they into automotive kind of um, work or, or the motor racing culture? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I, I would say that my career uh, kind of started in a way by, in I don't say a mistake, but it really was the recession that happened here in the United States. Um, my plan was to go into, um, I was working in education for the state of North Carolina. Um, I had had a really unique university experience. Um, I studied entrepreneurship. And I was the first student to do that at my college. And it just kind of changed my, um, it really just changed my path of, of what I wanted to do. I had had such a, a really unique experience that I wanted other people to make sure that they, they knew their opportunities um, in continuing their education. And then with the recession, uh, my job was completely eliminated uh, and ended up getting back into media uh, when I was in college, I'd done a couple internships with some local affiliates, um, like our local news station in Greensboro uh, that I grew up watching. And, um, you know, I don't want to say that I was deterred from wanting to enter into the business. Uh, I just didn't really know how to make it all happen. So it wasn't until uh, the recession when there was no jobs that I was like, all right, screw it. Let's try this thing out. <laughs> um, and I... Uh, Truthfully, I just decided that I would move to New York City. Um, I worked at a, a restaurant there at night to afford living there. And then I started working for an agent during the day who represented uh, broadcast talent. And these were guys and that have, you know, been the, the voices of all, all kinds of sports in the U.S. Um, throughout their careers that, um, some of the greats that we know on our side, like a Vern Lundquist or Tim McCarver, Bill Raftery. So it was a really neat kind of a um, look behind the look behind the curtain of that side of the world uh, before I stepped into to being talent myself. So it was not necessarily the the the, the straightest path, but um, in terms of of motorsports, growing up in North Carolina, we were surrounded by it. Uh, on all sides from dirt racing to NASCAR to drag racing. Uh, it really was a, a state that um, all expressions of automotive are kind of there if you if you want it. And uh, alongside uh, college athletics being a really big uh, thing within the state of North Carolina as well. And uh, I've done both. I started in, in college sports and now um, I get to work in motorsports. That is so fascinating, Amanda. And also you mentioned, you know, kind of unfortunately for you, as you are breaking through and, you know, interning and going through the, the kind of motions, the Great Recession had taken place. And, you know, you'd studied your entrepreneurship course as well. Mm -hmm. You're looking to make the next kind of step. For our listeners at home, could you describe just how challenging it was, you know, to move away from your family, you know, and move all the way to New York? And also the challenges as well of like trying to find an opportunity in such a field that's so competitive because i feel even recently with the pandemic we've heard similar things as well 
you know, about people struggling to find kind of work in the, the sectors they desire. And I think they can take a lot of inspiration from your story and just how you managed to, you know, get through those hard times. Yeah, you know, some of it is also just being, na- I don't want to say naive is the right thing, but I just kind of went through, um, I really had no other options. Um, I, you know, I, you're in your early 20s, every, you feel like the weight of the world is on you already. You have kind of don't even know where to put one foot in front of you. And um, the move to New York City was was truly prompted by this idea of, well, let me go see if I can be a sports broadcaster and I might as well go to the biggest city in the U.S. to do it. And um, the waiting, being a server, um, and even uh, kids that I mentor, you know, now, I, you know, I always talk to them about the financial struggle that, that comes along with this business. Uh, I mean, I would say for the first seven years of this, I was doing a lot of work for free um, or taking, you know, gigs just to have an opportunity. Um, so you kind of need a second or third income to help you work your first job, which is, is silly. And if, you know, if, if I ever get a soapbox to stand on, that's what I hope to, um, to you know, bring attention to, because it is a really difficult business to get started in. But um, yeah, I guess, you know, for, for me, the, um, the New York, uh, it's, it's about an eight hour drive from, from where I grew up. Um, and about a one and a half hour flight. So, um, luckily my, uh, mom would come visit me (laughs) here and there. And, uh, it was a, it it really was a nice transition. And I had a, I had a good amount of friends from, uh, that I had known growing up in college and new friends of friends in New York. So it, it, it was, it was a nice, it was a nice transition. And, um, looking back on it, sometimes I'm like, wow, I was 22 years old living in New York City. And it, it, it's still sometimes I'm like, wow, I did that really? But yeah, that, that was it. Uh, it was the, the risk of, um, I guess, not knowing was more scary to me than it not working out. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you said that as well, Amanda, because it gives, I think, a lot of our listeners reassurance that, you know, nothing's too far away or nothing's impossible if you put the right commitment, the right time, right effort into it as well. And you took that leap of faith and look at the amazing, like, you know, blossoming career you have now. And actually to touch on Thank that, you. you know. You get the call further down the line from Ken <laughs> Adelson from the, the vice. She's like the, the vice president and the content officer of the National Hot Rod Association as well. At that time, like how much knowledge did you have about the hot rod and kind of drag racing scene? And, you know, with your kind of time that you spent in that kind of segment as well, what's the most fascinating thing you've learned about the community or the culture? Oh, gosh, if you've never been to a drag race, put it on your list. It is uh, to me, I think I get the question I probably get asked the most is, you know, what's next or what's the next gig? And uh, drag racing is something that um, I hope that uh, I can stay in that job as as long as they'll keep me because it's been um, such a gift. Uh, This is my seventh season with uh, the National Hot Rod Association and it is just a sport that is an explosion of senses. It's a sport that you you hear, you taste, you touch, you see, you feel. It's there. The, it's just every sense times a thousand. Uh, these cars are launching on a starting line at eleven thousand horsepower, crossing the quarter mile at three hundred and thirty-five miles per hour in 3.7 seconds so it's really it's just an experience that every time you're just like wow a human actually does this uh and that's the thing that i find is so special about it uh the idea that when you get to the finish line a race can be decided by ten thousandths of a second which is less than an inch so (laughs) it's just a a really special um form of motorsport and i you know i think that's what's really cool about uh, motorsports and in, in summary, like if there's something for everyone, right. With it, there's so many things that involves, um, motors, whether it's, you know, land, air, sea, or, you know, bikes, or, uh, there's such a, there's, there's something for everyone. And, um, I'm lucky and blessed that I get to, to do a lot of it. So with, um, 
yeah, being with drag racing, it, it, it is at the core of me. Um, I, like I said, I hope I get to do it forever. And um, now starting to add other experiences from the sports car side to endurance racing, um, Formula E, all the kind of stuff that adds on to it. Uh, it's just a, a way to just continue to challenge myself and, and learn and grow and be, as, be a part of as much as I can. That's so true, you know, and like you mentioned as well, this in relation to the drag racing, it's so breathtaking. And, you know, I was having a look and doing some due diligence research as well. Yeah. And I was like, wow, these guys are like gladiators. They're extremely sure. brave. And, <laughs> exactly. And one thing I wanted to kind of ask you as well, Amanda, was, um, you know, now that we know that you work with Fox Sports, uh, you appear on some really amazing segments, by the way, one of them of which Thank is you. Walk a Thousand Feet, which yeah. I implore all of our listeners at home to, to definitely check out. But for people that haven't seen it before, Amanda, could you kind of give them an explanation of the, the premise of the show? And kind of a question for me is, in terms of exploring personalities of the drivers, mm -hmm. the teams, the mechanics, do you believe that this is giving you a way of like building rapport with them in, in such a way? Oh, yeah. You know, and it's I think it extends beyond just the relationship that, you know, I, I get to create with these guys over the last seven years. Uh, Walk a Thousand Feet is... Um, essentially, uh, a driver and I will take a stroll down the drag strip, and uh, normally, uh, we normally pick strips that are um, somewhat connected to the driver. Uh, let's say that this is the drag strip that they got their first win at, or this could be the drag strip that they consider their home track, or this could be the drag strip that, you know, they may have had a crash at before, and now they're coming back to to now dominate so there, there's there, we kind of try to do those associations as well but it's it's a very kind of informal get to know the driver without everything being um so structured around race day uh these guys as i said um you, you call them gladiators i think it's a perfect way to to describe the person that is willing to sit in a vehicle that is essentially um, I mean, you, the purpose of a nitromethane engine is to make it as angry as possible so that it will produce that 11,000 horsepower and reach top speeds of close to 340 miles an hour. Uh, the idea that a human would want to s effectively strap. We can make connections from the viewer to the driver through segments like walk a thousand feet is is something i'm really proud of absolutely amanda i think it's really insightful and like a couple of kind of themes we'll discuss later on in the show as well but does that that theme of like getting to know the drivers really understanding them like taking them kind of out of an environment where they're going to feel pressure but comfortable enough of an environment where it's not completely alien to them and just the way you are as well your mannerisms just how attentive you are i think really works quite well with pretty much all the drivers i've seen you interview so it is an amazing show and like i said before i think all of our viewers they are like you know if they haven't checked out before they're doing themselves an injustice they really need to check it out because it's super fascinating and actually on a similar theme as well amanda you know as an amazing and very talented reporter that you are you've had the opportunity to attend some very prestigious events and been able to take part even in a drive a drag racing school too amongst other cool things but what would you say is the coolest event you've been able to participate and learn from Oh, I, it goes to the one that I was able to do like just last week and um, being invited to cover uh, the spa 24 hour was um, by far a milestone event for my career. Um, I had, you know, you have an expectation of what you think something is going to be or you, you try to go through your mind just to prepare yourself and uh, from the from the time I, I got into to Belgium and got over to to spa and just taking in the culture and um, all of the the little the town around spa and the parade that happened on Thursday and the celebration of of GT racing that was so on display this uh, this year around with the 30th anniversary of GT racing so it was um, I, I I think I'm still on a high from it um i ended up uh i we didn't really establish how we were gonna work breaks or how that was was going to go and i think just being on u.s time still even when the race started on saturday 
Um, I ended up working uh, from race start. Um, I took like a, a, a dinner break, I think, just because I, you know, had to remind myself to to eat through all the adrenaline. Um, but I ended up working until 3.30 in the morning. I uh, went back to the hotel, slept four hours, uh, showered so I could feel like it was a brand new day and was back on site uh, on pit lane by 9 a.m. and uh, worked through the rest of, rest of the day. And um, to see the evolution of emotion um, and all kinds of emotion, you know, there's heartbreak, there's joy, there's frustration, um, and you're experiencing, you're kind of co co-experiencing this in a habitat with from crew guys to drivers to teams and being in that that space and time uh with these guys is something that um will always be be special to me i you know i hope i i don't want to do a 24-hour race next week because <laughs> it is <laughs> it's, it's 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 a, it's a lot um but uh, the idea of being able to do it again, uh, I can't wait for it. And um, I know it probably will never be like the first time, uh, but it, it's something just so magical and special that, that I, I, I highly encourage other people to seek it out. Oh, definitely, Amanda. I agree with you, you know. And um, I think, like you said, you went just at the perfect time as well because as you, as you kind of touched on there as well, Spa as a circuit had been kind of redeveloped and had some maintenance done to it. So I believe Arouge had been re reprofiled. So yeah. they actually put a, a new grandstand there, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of your commentator colleagues is, was saying as well, oh, there's like a big purple light, you know, shining into the source at turn one. And then yeah. they were figuring out that actually it was like a concert stage in the village, not yes. too far away as well. So yeah, again, it was the festival exactly which again is just really cool as well and i think it's great value for money for the fans you know to be able to get that live kind of interaction not only with the team the drivers the racing but to have that entertainment factor as well and then as you mentioned as well amanda like you know gt3 racing has been going on for such a long period of time the spa 24 hours is like a very historic race mm -hmm. because it's one of the first endurance races for the gt sports car series of such and just to have the cars drive through the streets on the parade and the name and caliber of drivers there as well, um, you know, from very experienced teams too. It's just like a melting pot of so many yeah. different fascinating things that makes the sports amazing. And actually, Amanda, I think it's a great segue into the next uh, segment of the podcast I wanted to get in with you on is, um, I'm going to call it seeing through the visor because Amanda, sometimes <laughs> the way I see you like interviewing these drivers, it's like you're genuinely looking through the visor because you know, <laughs> kind of like uh, like um alley -oop this one insurance racing as you mentioned you touched on it can be very emotional you know for the drivers mm -hmm. the mechanics the strategists the rule on the limit in overtime and just with the perspective and i'll always give credit for this as well amanda just your innate ability to bring the sports closer to the fans is second to none because Thank the you. insight that we see you know between the highs and the lows of the team in the mm -hmm. garage you know at the end of the race i was watching um a young um audi academy driver being thomas neubauer he just finished the mm -hmm. race for one of the wrt teams and he was in tears he didn't get out of the car for like five minutes because he's crying yeah. with emotions you know and just also another thing I wanted to touch on as well is that very intense interview between you and the Emil Frey driver, Albert Costa. He had just jumped in the car yeah. to do a stint in the Lamborghini. And unfortunately, he um, he said he slipped on some oil. Whether the footage you showed him afterwards um, supports that is a different story. But again, just, you know, that emotion, that kind of like wave of heat that you probably feel from the drivers as they're speaking mm. to you and they've just jumped out of these cars and for me probably the highlight of it all um amanda i was like tweeting georgina georgina and i was like amanda's such a boss i love this <laughs> like the moment you had with nikki tim as well like, yes um, of as course <laughs> exactly <laughs> i think that video has done rounds on the internet but again for those who probably just missed out nikki team a very established danish uh gt3 driver he's so profound in le mans and all these other world endurance series um jumps into aston martin Aston didn't really have a great uh, BOP, balance of performance for those who are getting into it. So the car didn't really look as if it was going to really challenge for the race win. But again, it's a 24-hour race, so so much could happen. And in the last three or four hours, their car that had always been kind of in the top 10, top 15, was now in the top four and really going for it. So they were having it out with the lead Mercedes, the number, I think it was 88 
um, Akodis ASP uh, AMG team. And Jules Gunnar and Nikki Tim just go yeah. side by side through a rouge. <laughs> and Nikki Tim unfortunately comes worse off. And straight away, just, I think he brought the car into the pits just to do a, t- a tire swap, driver swap. And just Amanda, just, just I like, I honestly, I, I admire you so much. And just, I'm so like, you know, just excited by what you did. Because most people would probably stay away from a character like Nikki Tim, but you're like, no, I'm going to go straight for it. You know, and you asked him the really tri- tricky question. So kind of question I wanted to put forward to you, Amanda, was like, how do you balance having emotional intelligence and compassion for the drivers? But at the same time, you know, like, uh, you know, ask the difficult and tricky questions that need to be asked, especially in line with bringing the sports and, you know, the information we need to the fans. I, you know, it is a balance, and I think that's a, a, a perfect way to to describe it. Um, you know, there's there's also sometimes you get ten to fifteen seconds before an interview goes live uh, that I can, you know, kind of um, like that's the first time I'd ever spoken to Nikki. So the ability to kind of like walk him through what we're gonna do, or um, you know, just to make sure that hey, you're you're good, and 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 at the same point, you also don't want too much time to go by because you want to capture the emotion as quickly uh, to the moment that you can. Um, On drag, I think probably what's prepped me for this is working in drag racing. Um, I'm the reporter that is at the far end of the track. So I'm the first person these athletes drivers see the second they get out of a car just that just went 330 miles an hour. Um, You can imagine that um, the emotions uh, in that situation are so high, whether it's someone just won, someone was defeated, um, emotions between the drivers can be high. So I've always approached it um, because I have to have difficult conversations on both sides. I get to see the best moments of people's lives and sometimes the worst moments of people's lives. And it's, it's to me where it's, I'm, I'm motivated by having the um, essentially, I guess what I would say is, is the person that I answer to is the viewer um, I don't answer to the driver, obviously my boss, <laughs> of course, as well. <laughs> but the person that I really answer to is, is the person sitting on the couch watching this race. And what do they want to hear? What do they want to know from this person? And, and that's where I get, get most of my motivation. Even if, I'm, even if I am very uncomfortable and, you know, it's, it's a conversation that I don't want to have, it's still a conversation that the that the viewer and the audience deserves, and and that's what I I think I get um, my strength and and uh, desire to want to perform from. That's amazing, Amanda. And honestly, like I think a lot of our viewers, they would be very happy with the answer as well, because you know a lot of us as well like follow the Formula One, and there are sure. times you know where something happens and like um you know you have pundits that give you a report of what's happening, but. They don't necessarily always ask the correct questions or they don't ask questions I guess the the viewers want maybe because there's like something going on in the background or maybe there's like a a bias there or something like that but at least you know with you Amanda and your approach and your style it's so authentic and so like we commend it so highly as well because you know it's so rewarding and it genuinely feels like I'm right there with you at the race you know (laughs) with these drivers and their personalities and you know it's another question I wanted to ask you just on this topic as well of drivers and personalities and stuff in relation to the spa weekend and i'm gonna exclude nikki tim as well because i know that's sure. the, the popular choice you know what were your like most like memorable interviews or moments yeah. uh with some of the drivers and teams in that weekend so for me it, it will without a doubt go down to the last 20 minutes of the race uh i was standing by uh with the 88 mercedes um for the hopeful winner interview um it, you know we had to kind of establish that the mercedes at that point was probably going to win the race if everything went well and it wasn't just um from a coverage standpoint uh we were showing uh danny Yankadella and jules gunan as they you know went through these last 
10, five minutes. Uh, I think Jules had everything crossed on his body, his fingers, yeah. his toes, his legs. Um, and, you know, and Danny like shaking his leg and see so you're, you're seeing all of this, um, you know, they, you don't want to get too ahead of yourself, but you also don't want to, you know, not enjoy the moment. Um, but for me to be in that room, um, not only am I looking at the drivers, uh, I'm looking at, you know, anyone from the person handling team communications to the crew guys, to the engineers and the strategists and uh, just the, the change of the body language uh, in the room over those 20 minutes, uh, five minutes to go, you know, crew guys, you can see their shoulders start dropping and in, in, in hope, right? In the last minute, tears are starting to come into their eyes. And, and, you know, these are guys that have been up for 24 hours cat napping when they can. And the last, uh, I still remember when uh, Rafael Marcello was coming through the chicane at the end and the room just erupts as he takes the checkered flag. And that to me, being able to visually watch along to the achievement after everything that had gone into getting to that moment, um, it I still get chills thinking about it. So in experiencing kind of the emotion with everyone and at the very end with the uh, winner's interview with Joel and Danny, uh, you know, they were celebrating with the crew and I just had to jump right in there and, and so that we could make sure that we, you know, captured this moment. And after speaking uh, with both of those guys and uh, I threw like very quickly at the end, I it was like, well, what would you got, what do you want to say to Raffaele? And they just started screaming. And so that was, <laughs> um, that was the, that was the end of it. And that was also, I knew that was the end of the 24 hours for me as well. And, uh, I just kind of walked away. Um, I, you know, standing on pit lane, looking down as, as they're still, uh, that whole group is, is still wildly celebrating and I like, I started crying myself. <laughs> it was like this release of, um, uh, wow, we actually did it. And it is, it, there is just something so special about a 24 hour race. Uh, you go into it thinking, um, you know, gosh, this is going to be forever. And then you get to the moment where it comes down to the end and it's, it's just a, a beautiful thing to celebrate. Absolutely, Amanda. I think you encaptured it beautifully because even just as like a TV watcher myself, like trying to follow everything. And it's funny you mentioned Raffaello as well because we had him on the podcast too. And he is also Aww. quite an interesting character. Just um, like you mentioned, just all three of those drivers driving for the same team, the ATA, Acodus, ASP, Mercedes team. They're all kind of different and in different parts of their careers as well because Jules is a slightly older one. He's French, so he's a bit more funnier and a bit more open. Danny, to me, I, I haven't had too many interactions with Danny, but he seems like the more kind of like calculated, more superstitious, not wanting to give too much away. <laughs> And then Raffaele, he's just like literally the Swiss Kimi Raikkonen. Just, you know, even when we had him on earlier, just like, uh, so could you tell us about this? And everything was one, uh, one word, one answer. Yep. And it took kind of some time to build that kind of rapport and connection where he started to, you know, like um, loosen up a bit and like have a bit more fun with us. But I was so happy for them as well. And I actually remember the TV show of you as well, like grabbing uh, Gunon and um, Danny as well. Like, hello, hello, one second, one second, interview, interview. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just, and I'm glad you captured that moment as well because it was just so real and so authentic. And for many of us at home, it's just amazing, you know, to just get that insight, that perspective, just that raw feeling as well. So um, it, it was so, so, so amazing, Amanda. And I'm glad as well that you had a, a great experience there. And hopefully, not hopefully, definitely, I hope you're there <laughs> next, next season as well. They really, really, really need to bring you back again. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and it was, you know, part of it is the, you know, I also wanted to make sure that even, you know, the, the difference in the questions that I had for Jules and for Danny, that they were specific uh, to, their, to their journey in that 24 hour win and just making sure that, uh, you know, their, their path was honored with it. So uh, it, it's, it's interesting, the, the motivations of, um, you know, you, you hope to do, you hope to 
do those moments proper justice. And uh, I think we were all very proud with, with how um, all of that came out. And hopefully, and in, in as as a viewer, um, hopefully that uh, connection uh, was made uh, for for everyone involved. So thank you. No, it was a uh, that that without a doubt is a career highlight of mine at the moment. Oh, Amanda, I'm sure there's many to come, and you know we know <laughs> that you're on a tight schedule. So there's only well, there's a couple more like very pertinent topics I wanted to get sure. into on today's episode as well, because you're the perfect person and very qualified. I feel to give us a, a kind of stare on this as well. Another big topic I wanted to discuss on today's episode, Amanda, was women in power. I like that sure. phrase a lot. It just like it's amazing and kind of to add some more meat to the bone as well to say you know at the 24 hours of spa we saw the first ever female saudi arabian driver in rima jafali securing a podium in our class we saw like the first ever female entrepreneur and a team owner being samantha tan drive her own bmw m4 gt3 car to the finish of the whole 24 hour race and then you know if that wasn't enough then you also had the iron dames team consisting of only female drivers only female engineers and only female mechanics performing exceptionally well and that's just in the 24 hours of spa you know also in the world of formula one we're seeing an amazing woman in hannah smith lead the race strategy department for red bull racing who currently lead the championship currently the question i wanted to ask you amanda is what's your honest assessment on the perspective of women in motorsport as we stand currently and do you believe we can be optimistic of seeing the likes of a, a Jamie Chadwick, for example, yeah. break into a ground series like F1? I don't think that it could be better uh, or, well, it will be better than it is right now. But I think that we're also in a, in a really good space with it. Um, I do a lot with uh, celebrating women in motorsports and automotive um, we do a, a series here in the U.S. called Women Shifting Gears with that with that mission to um, celebrate and honor women um, in positions of power um, from executives to drivers to um, strategists uh, of the like. But it to me, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is, you know, there's there's already, um, you know, there are women placed around this industry that have these these really great roles and uh what i've what i've noticed is it's kind of the trait that you know i, th I think women carry in in industries that are male dominated we just keep our head down and work really hard uh mm -hmm. so it, it's it's not that it's not that you it, you may not have heard of us but we're there and i, I think that's one of the reasons um, I am blessed to be able to be surrounded by uh, women in this business that have become friends and mentors. Uh, I, I think one of the struggles that I often hear, and, and I have it myself, um, but of other women in the business is, uh, the, we call it the imposter syndrome. And it's, whoa, you know, should I be here? Am I, am I good enough? Am, you know, am I representing this correctly? And uh, I read a quote on the imposter syndrome syndrome uh, recently of almost like uh, crashing a wedding. And whether you're supposed to be be there or not, you might as well eat all the cake while you're there. <laughs> and I just, I just love that analogy of like trying to, um, you know, be, you know, be included in the conversation, sit at the table uh, and know that, that you're qualified and, and capable capable of the work. But yeah, I know. I mean, I, with the W series, um, I've interviewed a couple of people um, I'm from that world. And uh, you look at the success that Jamie Chadwick has had um, in her, in her career. Uh, I would say that uh, I am hopeful uh, within my lifetime and hopefully way shorter than that. Hopefully in the next five, 10 years, uh, we see a female competing at that level. Absolutely. Absolutely, Amanda. And one other thing I wanted to ask you as well, whilst we're on the topic of this, you know, because at least in Europe, like there's a drag racing scene, but I, I just don't think yeah. you can beat the Americans when it comes to sure. drag racing. That's like it's phenomenal out there with the hot rods and stuff. But from the female perspective, like, are there any, if, for example, there was a new person that hadn't really had many interactions or much kind of dealings with um hot, hot rod racing or drag racing sure. before 
and there was a female driver right? or, or a group of female drivers kind of oh, yeah. part of the NRA at the moment. Who would you recommend and which female drivers would you um, advise them to, to check out? Oh gosh, there we have such a handful that um, I can't I can't recommend one or the other because they all sure. have their own story. Yeah, all have their own stories, and I'll just go from uh, the top fuel class, which are the dragsters, the long, skinny uh, looking things with the parachutes. Uh, you have Brittany Force, who is a top fuel world champion. She won her first championship in two thousand and seventeen. Uh, she's currently the points leader in our series right now as well. And she's the daughter of one of the most famous drag racers of all time, John Force. So it's kind of neat that, um, you know, she, we have photos of her as a baby in the winner's circle, and now she is her own winner. Um, so I would, you know, check out Brittany Force, uh, Leah Pruitt. Uh, she's coming off of a, of a win season, just started a brand new team alongside her husband, uh, Tony Stewart. Uh, so uh, Leah is just dynamic, um, has really, you know, clawed her way into making sure that she's a force in this business. Um, then if you go down to Funny Car, uh, Alexis DeJoria, uh, this woman is, without a better word, just a badass. <laughs> uh, I think anyone that drives a funny car is a badass. So the idea that this woman wants to sit in a car with a nitrine, nitromethane engine in front of her face uh, is pretty spectacular. Um, and then in our other categories, uh, so we have Pro Stock and Pro Stock Motorcycle. Uh, in Pro Stock, uh, Erica Ender, she's a five-time world champion. Uh, her story was encapsulated in a Disney movie when she was a kid. Um, she's been junior drag racing pretty much her whole life. Um, and then Angel Sempe on motorcycles, she's the winningest female in all of motorsports. So I can't pick one, um, sure. but all of these, all of these incredible women have their own story and their own uh, right to be celebrated by the accomplishments that they have achieved. That's so amazing, Amanda. And what I like as well with that response you just gave us too was it's not even just the case that it's just one or two. There's like you can yeah. count on your hand almost like, you know, like multiple female drivers sure. that you've said that have had great success, you know, in the drag racing series. And, you know, mm -hmm. it looks like it's something that's going to be sustained that will continue to grow, which is, I think, what the world needs. And it's more engaging for everybody as well to see that and to just have that natural progression as well and to see a fairer play uh, platform as well. So I really hope that that translates into other kind of um, motorsport series and just generally in the world. You know, because there are so many, you know, powerful women in the world. Now, one of the women that always have like inspired me is like my mom. I always tell people yeah. without my mom, you know, I'd be a completely different person. And she always made sacrifices for like, the, like basically my own betterment, you know, and would leave herself, you know, undone just to give me a better opportunity. So that respect, I think, is definitely overdue. And I'm very, very proud and very impressed that, you know, we're seeing it in so many different facets and forms. And you, as the amazing presenter and reporter you, you are as well, Amanda, you're giving us that kind of, um, you know, insight into things as well. Honestly, it's amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, your mom sounds amazing. I uh, I don't think moms get as much credit. <laughs> oh, definitely not. Because uh, they, <laughs> they, they do sacrifice a lot for their kids. So that's wonderful of you giving her um, a shout out here. Sounds very oh, well deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And moving on to a, a different topic, um, I think, again, we might as well ask you this as well. There's been an interesting thing within the F1 kind of Twitter space about, like, the Americanization of F1. Sure. I don't necessarily agree with it. I, My own personal view is, is that I like that, you know, Liberty Media, as the, mm -hmm. the owners of Formula One now and the shareholders, they're trying to diversify the sport and to bring it into new markets it's never been to before. You know, and kind of on that theme, we saw the first inaugural Miami Grand Prix this year, which I think overall was a success, although it had one or two kind of issues which are being addressed, you know, and then everything's being secured and finalized for the Vegas Grand Prix next year, which seems very exciting. I wish I had the monies to go there myself, but uh, <laughs> something I can hopefully save up for and do at some stage. And then also, like, there's been a huge emphasis on a series like Drive to Survive as well, which has been like a, a hub for many new fans to try and get into the sport and to understand the teams, drivers, and just how things uh, are generally run. 
But the question is, Amanda, just like, what are your thoughts on the direction of Liberty Media with F1? And how important is it for them to grow the sport into different markets, and new parts of the world, but without diluting the essence of the sure. sport or its heritage? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a balance that, um, you know, not just F1's having to consider. You know, I think all kind of properties um, are going through an evolution of figuring out and, and not even just in motorsports, I would say, you know, from American football and um, college athletics. And um, I think that even MLB over here, I, I think it's an adjustment in what um, kind of new age media and digital content looks like, you know, a lot of, you know, behind the scenes and exclusive content is are those things that um, are driving engagement and driving um, interest. Uh, the thing that, um, you know, Miami was so uh, successful, I would say here stateside, because uh, I think we truly, whether it's good or bad, but we live in a, a generation now that, um, you know, being present at these mega events are kind of what's driving the, the energy around them. Um, you know, it's not just, you're not going to, I mean, we saw it at spa, you're not just going to, uh, a race anymore. Uh, there's, there's race and entertainment. Um, so it, it kind of can encapsulate, um, I would say a more massive individuals that are looking to be part of something unique and special. Uh, I think the Vegas race is going to be an absolute knockout. Uh, I think that that will become a race that will, uh, be for this generation of fan, uh, will be something that is still discussed in 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, looking at, um, I go to Vegas probably three times a year for work already. Uh, so I know it pretty well. I'm pretty intimately, um, uh, familiar with where the street circuit is going to go. And, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that that race is going to be successful here in the US. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, our fan base also isn't questioning, you know, it, three races in the United States is that too much? Um, or, you know, what, how can one country sustain um, that? And the other thing is, is uh, when, truthfully, we almost forget it ourselves being Americans, but, you know, the country really is so large. And all of those three from Austin, Texas, where CODA is, to Vegas and Miami, they are three extremely different cultures, three extremely different um, lifestyles. And uh, from the topography, uh, like one's in the desert, one's in uh, the state of Texas in the south, and one is, you know, a beach community uh, that is known for party and entertainment. So. Uh, I think that they are they are culturally so different that the expression of motorsport works. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we have that that same um, you know th those same kind of questions happening. Um, but I, I would say I think it extends beyond motorsport. I think every form of entertainment is is trying to um, assess what this next generation looks like. We had a um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the movie Field of Dreams. Um, but it's an American classic um, baseball movie. And uh, MLB last year decided to do a game. Field of Dreams was uh, essentially a, um, a baseball field in, surrounded by a cornfield in, in the Midwest. And, they, and MLB did that. And it was such a hit. Uh, that, uh, you know, just trying something different or NASCAR, they raced uh, at the LA Coliseum this year to kick off their season and called it the Bush Cloud. It, so I think, I think brands and properties taking risk um, are working, uh, but I do think that it needs to be calculated and, and also cautious to not alienate the core of, of the viewership and the fan base. Yeah, I, I definitely agree uh, there, Amanda. And that's the thing, like you said, it's like finding the balance. And I, I hope as well that, you know, especially in terms of Formula One, that, you know, the shareholders take into account, you know, the, the kind of varying positions of the fans and, you know, like at least 
you know certain events like Monaco and Las Vegas, they're going to be marquee, high-profile events, of course. But then maybe for the others, I hope that there's that kind of thought in mind, you know, that maybe tickets for less well-off families are still affordable sure. for them to attend. Yeah. And, you know, because at the end of the day, I think what's amazing about sport and just like music, just like film, like you mentioned there too, is it has that innate ability to bring people together from all different walks and lives or backgrounds. Yeah. And I think that's such a beautiful thing, you know, to, to explore and obviously to have in this modern day and age as well, you know, with all the storylines, drivers and, um, you know, stories that we get as well, which is so key. So, yeah, I'm really glad that we discussed that topic too, because it's a very kind of trendy one for, for sure. sure. But uh, yeah, you know, it's great to kind of go through it. And kind of bringing it to the, the conclusion of this uh this session amanda you've been amazing as well we definitely need to get you back on the show because honestly just i love your work we love all the work that you do and we're so appreciative of that but kind of what i wanted to ask you as well amanda was what advice would you give to the new generation of young kids uh young girls out there you know aspiring to be as successful as you you know and what would you say to younger amanda busick as well because from the sounds of it, you were very brave, very advantageous, <laughs> but I'm sure it wasn't without its, you know, one or two hiccups or, or mistakes or, or things that you probably do differently now. Yeah, I think that probably the, 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 I don't know, the best piece of advice that I'd probably give myself um, back then was to just, um, you know, and really try to enjoy the journey. Um, I was so motivated by my, um, I was extremely impatient. Um, and I don't mean it from an, an, an uh, you know, a, a lot of times people will throw around that millennials or Gen Z or, you know, they're so um, entitled or they have, you know, this, this, they, you know, desire for something that they haven't earned. I just more meant that I was impatient in the sense that it was my, it essentially was my ambition. Um, and the, with that, I had a very hard time in staying present uh, and enjoying what I was doing at the moment, whether that be, you know, being a server in New York City at 22 years old, um, you know, I'm already in my mind of like, well, you know, what's next in my career? How can I get there? Where am I going? As opposed to being, you know, now I look back at it, I'm like, holy, holy cow, you were 22 years old living in New York City. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, of course, there were moments that I enjoyed, I, I made really good friends. Um, but I would say it was even up until maybe a year or two ago, um, before I really just kind of, I don't say took my foot off the gas, but um, have, have really tried to remind myself um, to, you know, be proud in the place that I am at now and you know just kind of more trust in the process and the journey of, of where i'm going um so yeah i, I think that uh you know and you're, you're you're getting started in a and i think any kind of dream industry be it sports music fashion uh entertainment uh there are a lot of risk that that will come with it whether it's financial risk whether it's um you're going to miss a lot of holidays, um, <laughs> weddings of your friends, uh, very important moments in people's lives because you're having to dedicate yourself to, you know, what you're trying to achieve that will, you know, uh, will, will be the priority. So, um, yeah, I would, uh, absolutely, uh, if it's, if, if you're inspired by it, go for it. I think, um, if anything, the pandemic, uh, I would say taught, everyone of just how precious and short this life can be and uh i do think that um you know life is for the living so go for it beautifully portrayed there amanda i definitely agree you know and as the saying goes no risk no reward so yeah absolutely true. you know you have to be uh, willing you know to take the extra leap of faith to be able to kind of be you know persistent with your goals and dreams and aspirations and even sometimes if it doesn't seem like it's going to go the way you want it to yeah. sometimes you know that can be a beautiful stroke of luck too and it might put you in a yeah. different direction you never anticipated too you know on your journey to, to where you want to go 
for the end goal. So I absolutely agree. And I think there's a lot of value in the points that you just made there as well, Amanda. So thank you for that. And finally as well, Amanda, you know, thank you. Thank you again. Like I think I've been thanking <laughs> you a lot this episode because I'm still pinching myself that you're here. Just like it's the voice that I know from yes. the TV. And now you're actually <laughs> here as well. So like this is like another kind of yay moment for me. So uh, yeah, he's thank definitely you. fanboy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it's I a treat. Friend. I mean, but look at it. We're the three of us are around the world and we're connected because of motorsport. So, um, you know, the, the beauty of, of what um, can bring people together. So, you no, know, thank you for uh, reaching out. And um, I will, uh, uh, you said that uh, I might get to come on this thing again someday. So uh, I'm always just a message away. Let me know. Ah, oh, we'd love to, Amanda. We already know you're going to be a very popular, popular, popular guest. You're a celebrity, you know, to our fans. So, you know, like, I know that they're going to be super excited and we we'd, wouldn't even have to ask any questions. We wouldn't even hesitate. We'd love to bring you back on later on in the year as well and, you know, hear about more of your developments and, and kind of things you've been working on as well. But on that note, you know, are there any final words you wanted to, you know, say to your adoring fans like me? <laughs> and are there any upcoming events or or anything else that uh, they can look forward to that you're doing for the rest of the year? Yeah, so funny. Um, uh, I'm at the time in the season, I was saying earlier at the at the start of this podcast that, uh, you know, motorsports, we kind of chase the sun. So I, uh, I'm i on a 17 event in a row stretch right now, and I just Ooh. finished the fourth. So <laughs> um, I have a, a – the, the fifth one will be this weekend. I have a drag race coming up. I haven't uh, been on that series in about – uh, a month and a half now. So look forward to getting back to kind of, you know, what started this whole journey for me. And then, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it'll be a busy summer. Uh, I do a lot of work, uh, with Ferrari and their esports um, property. Uh, so I'll be bouncing in and out of, of that stuff. Um, more of the endurance, uh, the intercontinental, uh, GT comes to America next for the Indy eight hour. So that's coming up in October. Um, but no, I mean, thank you for, for all the support. Uh, I really uh, love my job. I feel sometimes guilty uh, that I get to do something that I love. Um, but I, I hope that uh, to the audience and to the viewer and uh, that, uh, that it comes with uh, the, um, what's the right way to say it? Uh, I, I'm, I get my motivation uh, from you guys. So thank you for the support and, and the care and the love because uh, it is, uh, there's a lot of sacrifice, but uh, for me, it's worth it. And I feel truly blessed. Oh, well, Amanda, honestly, the enthusiasm is shared with all of us. Like, we're so proud of you and we really, really love the work that you're doing as well. And I can confirm as well that, you know, the work you do, it definitely does come across quite sincere, you know, and quite honest and very insightful. I learn so much, you know, anytime I see you on the TV and have these conversations as well. So it's amazing. And, you know, on that note as well, Amanda, you know, for the, for the new listeners that, you know, are like hearing you for the first time and wanting to kind of follow your journey as well, where can they follow you? And also another kind of bonus question, Georgina asked me to ask this, by the way. So if you, right, I'm just going to say, <laughs> don't punch me, punch her. <laughs> the question was, yes, she actually asked uh, Maria Andretti this earlier on in the year as well. Pineapple and pizza, yay or nay? Yes. Now, not all the okay. time. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, I just, finally, I just had this. Finally. So I just had this discussion with someone because I was at uh, IndyCar had a race in Nashville this past weekend, and mm. they were serving pineapple on a hot dog. And Whoa. I was kind of at the first, at the initial hit of it, I was like, I'm not sure about this. But then I was like, well, but pineapple and pizza is good, and sure enough, it was delicious. So now, now there's a new. There's a new era of pineapple uh, combinations happening, and apparently it's now pineapple <laughs> and hot dogs. So there you go. Wow, that's that's just blown. My Amanda, that's a bombshell, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it it was for me too, but it was a, it was a good bombshell. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, that's an interesting one. And just to conclude, Amanda, where can our adoring fans find you? Yeah, so I'm on the, um, from Twitter to Instagram, it's, it's my first name, last name, Amanda Busick. Um, I have a website that I try to keep updated uh, as much as I can. Uh, it's amandabusick.com. 
Um, I try to put different uh, little articles that'll happen, go up there, um, some of my reels and just a, a biography of things that I'm up to and doing at the moment. But yeah, I, I try to uh, do as much as I can on on social media, we, you know, we get the privy of, of having, you know, access and behind the scenes coverage to a lot of events. And uh, I like to kind of give um, fans that opportunity to see some of the, the cool things that uh, we get to be part of. So uh, I, I use them as such, um, probably not uh, as good of, of sharing as, as I should, but you know, it, it, when I can and, and do it, I, I love being able to connect, um, viewers and fans to um you know where sometimes it's even just showcasing that i'm eating barbecue in kansas because that's where i'm at so <laughs> but and so just little simple things like that oh amanda we we really appreciate it you know any insight you know is is good insight for us and you know it's amazing that we have amazing reporters like yourself doing such an amazing job with just connecting you know that gap between the sports and the fans and making it align all in one so we're so happy we're so thankful um i'm positive as well that georgina is going to put your social media links and a link to the website as well because we always Thank say you. that stuff like that it will inspire, you know, the next Amanda Busick. Although there's only one, you know, like there'll be the next generation of, of like journalists and reporters that, you know, will be inspired by you and the work you do. And that's a very exciting world that I look to be, uh, you know, part of as well. So uh, we're so, so happy and so honored to have you. And we're so thankful as well, Amanda. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Fun show. Oh, excellent. Well, I'm so happy to say that. You put a huge smile on my face. So thank you for that. And uh, for our listeners as well, this has been episode four of our summer series shutdown. It's been your boy, AMG Dens, Denzel Clarkson, a.k.a. the British Michael B. Jordan. Oh, I, I at least wish I had his uh, dashingly good looks, but uh, we're working on that. But nonetheless, we'll be back, we'll be back with even more sensational content. And until next time, guys, we hope that you guys stay blessed, stay happy, stay positive. And we'll catch you next time on Stripping the Dipping. Peace.